AI, artificial intelligence. It's a hot topic nowadays, and it seems like everyone is trying to get in on the hype. Companies are eagerly splashing powered by AI all over their marketing with promises to save your time with this miracle technology. With the power of AI, washing machines will wash better and ovens will cook better. Sounds a little too good to be true, right? But what is AI anyway? When artists think of AI these days, the first thing they normally think of is image generation models like these. And whether they like them or view them as an existential threat, there's a lot of misunderstanding and confusion about how these AI models work. How do they generate images? And more importantly, where and how do they get their data anyway? Since AI seems to be cropping up more and more often, I think it's useful to have at least a basic understanding of how they work. At the very least, you'll be able to completely destroy your opponents the next time you have imaginary arguments in the shower, like me. Let's start by differentiating between modern generative AI and just every other use of the word. AI is a major buzzword at the moment, so people use the word very loosely to mean anything from actual machine learning to even just enemies in video games. And even if we're just referring to the field of machine learning, there are a lot of different branches with many advancements that have benefited humanity, such as helping doctors detect cancer in radiology, or simply filtering spam out of your email inbox. So when I'm talking about generative AI, what I'm really referring to are models that use machine learning to generate content, whether it be text like ChatGPT, or images like Midjourney, or any of the AI voice generators. And if I express grievances against AI, I'm specifically talking about generative AI. And I'm not just salty, I'm getting destroyed in Elden Ring. Let's briefly explain how modern image generators work. I'm a big believer of getting informed about the things that make me feel uncomfortable. I might potentially even change my mind when I learn more about that thing, but even if I don't, at least learning more about that thing is never a bad thing. It's also why I seem to have suspicious depth of knowledge in things such as Web3, NFT, and the Fifty Shades of Grey series. There have been various approaches to image generation over the years, but recently the versatility of diffusion models have been very popular. Before using diffusion models, we have to train it. So first we start with some images. Well, a lot of images actually. Where do we get these images? We'll cover that in a minute. Then we take these images and we do this to them. Okay, don't freak out. I know not everybody is a fan of maths, but all this formula means is that we add Gaussian noise to our image in progressive steps, like this. We do this until we can't even see the original image anymore. And we do this for all the images we have. So now we have a whole bunch of images that gradually get noisier and noisier. And we can use this as training data to train our diffusion model to reverse this process, one step at a time. And if we chain all these steps back together, our model should eventually be able to generate an image from pure noise. When people talk about artificial intelligence, they often tend to anthropomorphize it using terms like learning and inspiration. For this reason, some people even go as far as claiming that AI learns just like humans do. But to any artist, it should be pretty clear that if you want to say, learn how to draw a horse, you don't start by memorizing a hundred thousand different images of horses for inspiration and then conjure up a collection of pixels from pure noise that is statistically likely to be similar to an image of a horse. At their core, diffusion models are just very complicated statistical models. If all a human needed to do was to look at a lot of things to learn how to draw them, then in theory, everyone should at least be able to draw a human face, since we all spend a great deal of time looking at faces. But humans are kind of different in that they need far less input data than machines do, because they don't learn by encoding millions of images. Humans learn by understanding. If we want to learn how to draw a horse, we have to start by understanding the underlying structure of horses, like the skeleton or the musculature. We need to examine how light reflects from their coats. And because we're able to infer and create connections, we can learn from these minuscule tiny little datasets, something that generative AI today is incapable of doing. You might have noticed that during my explanation of diffusion models, I missed a very important element. I described how the images were generated from pure noise, but what about the text? Where do the prompts come in? You know, the extremely beautiful, gorgeous woman wearing a strapless black top, oil painting style, very detailed shadows, intricate detail, good anatomy, absolutely enormous breasts kind of stuff. In order to do that, the diffusion model must also be able to take some kind of text input, or prompts as they are popularly known. 
And to guide the diffusion process towards the meaning of the prompt, you actually need a dataset with accurate, high-quality text descriptions. So this isn't as easy to get as it seems. Some initial attempts at getting this training data started from the internet, which makes sense since there are plenty of images available to uh, borrow from the internet. But remember, we also need accurate descriptions of these images. Relying on your average internet user to caption their images correctly? Yeah, that went about as well as expected. The other option was to hire people to individually label images. Of course, manually labeling them in this way was extremely expensive. The ImageNet database has 14 million text image pairs, and it required 25,000 workers to annotate. I know 14 million sounds like a lot, but image generation models actually need more than that. And in the meantime, other larger models were also being created. ImageNet was publicly available, but these other datasets, usually they were kept private and were inaccessible to researchers. So what then? In 2021, a neural network called Contrastive Language Pretraining, or CLIP, was released by OpenAI. CLIP is an AI model that can understand both verbal and visual concepts, and that's actually an important component of many image generation models. For now, the only thing about CLIP we need to be concerned about is that it can understand concepts in text and images, and it can encode this concept into data. So CLIP can encode both the word cat and an image of a cat into data into what we call an encoding. And the encoding for the word cat and an image of a cat should theoretically be very similar. An astute viewer may already be figuring out where I'm going with this. If it's expensive to get humans to label images, why not get AI to help with that? And that's exactly the idea behind Lion 5B. It begins with Common Crawl, a public web archive of everything on the internet. Everything. We're talking 3 billion web pages and 300 terabytes of data. So they take the data from Common Crawl and primarily focus on extracting images with alt text, which is very useful for people with visual impairments, as this text is read out loud by screen readers. It's a little bit ironic to me that a feature mostly used to help vision impaired humans is now being used to help vision impaired machines, but anyway, let's move on. Looking at alt text is already a good start, since in order to improve the accessibility and SEO of their website, people are already incentivized to write good, descriptive alt text. But this is still the internet, after all. Relying on people to use alt text for its originally designed purpose is not the best idea. So here's where Clip comes in. It can't generate natural language text on its own, but what it can do is filter out labels that don't describe the text well. For each text image pair, Clip generates an encoding for both the text and the image. Then, these encodings are compared, and if the encodings aren't similar enough, that text image pair is filtered out, and not included in the final datasets. Along with some additional filtering to remove low-quality text or images, this process removes almost 90% of the original 50 billion images, leaving 5.85 billion images with high-quality labels written by humans. And this enormous dataset was available to everyone, leading to the introduction of impressive image generation models like Stable Diffusion, which publicly listed Lion as one of its collaborators. I think by this point it might be clear that gathering high-quality training data is actually very difficult. In fact, it's the stated goal of Common Crawl to democratize data, so that everyone, not just large companies with lots of resources, can have access to data like this. So artists that are concerned that Twitter trends are some underhanded way of gathering data for generative AI don't really have to worry about it. It's pretty unlikely that a random Twitter guy has the resources or incentive to compile a massive dataset by going through quote retweets, especially when Lion is right there and it's free to use. So far, I've only talked about Lion 5B, which is the only massively openly available dataset of text image pairs, which is what Stable Diffusion uses. But what about other models? While I would love to talk in detail about those, they haven't quite been as open as Stable Diffusion. Midjourney is famously secretive, so all I managed to find was an interview on Forbes with Midjourney founder and CEO David Holes, who stated that we use the open datasets that are published and train across those. So probably Lion, but who knows for certain. As for OpenAI's DALL-E, they take Clip one step further and have it actually generate synthetic captions, rather than simply filtering, like the Lion datasets. As for where they found the images to caption, well, they often like to use the word publicly available when referring to their training data. Here's their CTO, Mira Murati, answering questions about their video generation AI model, Sora. We used publicly available data and licensed data. So, videos on YouTube? 
if they were publicly available, publicly available to use. It was publicly available or licensed data. I don't know about you guys, but it kind of sounds like publicly available is just another way of saying I found it on the internet so I can use it, which is the usual excuse unscrupulous manufacturers trot out when they're caught stealing an artist's work to put on their products. Coincidentally, it's also the same excuse 13-year-old art thieves on DeviantArt use. So I think it's pretty clear that these datasets consisting of billions of images, many of which are illustrations and artworks created by artists, were not taken with permission. In fact, the founder of Midjourney states that there isn't really a way to get 100 million images and know where they're coming from, and then automatically trace it to an owner. In other words, it is impossible right now to ask each of these millions of artists for consent. So they didn't. There are some artists who claim to have created ethical AI models that are trained only on their own work. Unfortunately, training a generative image AI model with a small dataset isn't possible with current technology. It is possible to fine-tune an existing model with an artist's work to mimic their style, but you can't do that without an underlying existing model that was trained on billions of images. These are the sort of models you'll find on websites like Civet AI. What about Firefly? That's Adobe's generative AI offering, by the way, and they claim it's trained on licensed content, that is, Adobe stock, along with public domain content. That means they actually had permission to use the images they did, and that's fine, right? Maybe, but I suspect that the people who were uploading their work to Adobe stock a decade before generative AI even existed didn't have any clue that they were signing up to feed their work into an AI model. Eric Urquhart, a VizDev artist at DreamWorks, recounts that he was a regular contributor to a stock image company known as Photolia back in 2013. At some point, Adobe purchased Photolia and rolled its offerings into Adobe stock. However, he states, At no time did Adobe ever ask me or any other contributors that I know our permission or consent to use our images. It was just never mentioned. So it's possible that Firefly isn't quite as ethical as Adobe likes to claim. Even now, advancements in AI are continuing apace and generative models are just getting better and better. The landscape of the art industry is rapidly changing and people are being forced to adapt whether they want to or not. I hope that those of you wanting to understand a little more about how this technology works have managed to learn a little and are perhaps a bit better equipped to deal with the changes caused by AI. If that's the case, please consider subscribing. Of course, even though I did my best to research properly, I'm not a domain expert, so if there's anywhere I messed up, feel free to let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Bye bye!